Wir sind Merck, ein lebendiges Wissenschafts- und Technologieunternehmen. Wissenschaft ist das Herzstück unserer Arbeit. Sie ist die Grundlage unserer Entdeckungen und der Technologien, die wir entwickeln. Im Leben von Millionen von Menschen macht die Leidenschaft unserer neugierigen Köpfe täglich einen entscheidenden Unterschied. In unserem Healthcare-Bereich erforschen wir neue Möglichkeiten zur Behandlung schwerer Krankheiten wie Multiple Sklerose und Krebs. Unsere Life Science Experten unterstützen Wissenschaftler bei der Entwicklung von Lösungen. We have important uh, scientists who help us and who develop things further. Our know-how is in the technology and in the way information is being um, preceded and dealt with. We believe in a positive power of science and technology. It has been accompanying us since 1668 and we are trying to um, increase it and develop it further. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now starting our digital event at the representation of uh, Hessen, um, which was organized by Lucia Puttrich, responsible for uh, um, European Affairs and the company Merck Limited. Well, we apologize for the technical problems. Uh, we have had some difficulties starting, but uh, I believe that uh, we can now uh, kick off. And I'm sure we're going to have an interesting, interest, interesting discussion round. Without um, further ado, I'd like to give the floor to uh, the um, Minister, Mrs. Butrich uh, from Hessen, responsible for European Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to our digital event from the representation of Hessen here in Brussels. We were hoping that in November we would be actually able to meet uh, and that we would have overcome uh, COVID, but uh, things have turned out to be differently. So I couldn't welcome you personally. But I think it's better that we do have it digitally rather than not having it at all. We have had difficult times uh, ever since March. I would uh, also like to express my gratitude to the company Merck, in particular in front of the um, CEO, Mr. Oshman. But I would also like to give my gratitude to, to the head of corporate and government re relations, Tim Mertens, who is uh, responsible for Merck here in Brussels. Uh, thank you very much for the good cooperation. Merck is a very important uh, spokesperson, apart from the headquarter in Darmstadt, Germany. Merck is also present in Brussels. Uh, we have developed a whole series of cooperation because Merck is not only an active player in, at international trade, but also in the research and in the fight uh, against Corona. The uh, event today uh, has um, been planned at the right point of time. The Trade Minister, Mr. Dubrovsky, uh, wants to make sure that the priority of the European Union uh, will be set and uh, decided upon for the coming year. Trade policies is, apart from uh, com competitiveness, a very important pillar of the, the uh, uh, President of Ursula the, the Leinen, responsible for this in the European Commission. The relationship to the other two large partners, large nations, China and the United States, are of a decisive role. Our strength being uh, the interior market. So we have to be able to assure that our companies are competitive. We need open markets and we don't need protectionism. And with the uh, election of the new President of the United States, Joe Biden, I have new hopes that uh, um, trade talks can be started with the United States. For Hessen, uh, this is of great importance because the United States are the most important trade partner. 
uh, we have export, exported 7.2 billion of goods to the United States in 2018. The other uh, construction site is China. There is a trade. We want to get a new trade um, agreement with China. It's very important that the European Union um, gets the uh, sub subsidy policy into the right balance. And uh, here it is important for Hessen. China in 2018 uh, was um, uh, the most important trade partner with uh, 2.1 billion. And for Hessen, it's also very important. So, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that there is a vital challenge for the European Union policies in trade, in particular in the relationship to China and the United States. So we would like to, to use the multilateral system of the WTO. How, how we are we going to deal with it? What is there to be done? How, sh how, what should the trade policy look like? This is something we are going to discuss about today. And we hope that we get uh, new ideas for the cooperation for Hessen, for the land of Hessen, but also for the European Union in general. Thank you very much to Hessen, to the uh, minister from Hessen. We're going to continue our program with uh, the uh, um, chair, the CEO of the Merck, of company Merck, Mr. Stefan Oschmann. And we're going to show a video. Dear Minister, Mr. Sputrich, dear members of the European Parliament, Mr. Sim, it is of course very sad that we couldn't meet personally in Brussels today. At the same time, however, I'm glad that the, the representation of uh, Hessen, together with Merck, decided to organize this uh, digital conference anyway. The topic of uh, the um, trade policy with uh, Chimera and the European Union. Uh, we have had the pandemic uh, ever since the beginning of the year, so it's one of the largest um, uh, problems uh, of the last, last decades. Never in the past before we had anything similar, and uh, we realized that international trade is very important for our health, for our wealth and uh, well-being. Let's have a look, for example, at the development of vaccines um, and uh, all sorts of technological advancements. Uh, such as, for example, I'm thinking about the semiconductor industry. The international trade is confronted with the political, because of the political tension between China and the United States. This can be realized in different areas, such as, for example, for uh, customs uh, penalties or um, a World Trade Organization, uh, which can't do anything about any conflicts taking place. So what we need is uh, that we need better medica medical devices and medication in order to make sure that uh, patients and uh, researchers can be uh, provided with um, what they need. Because of the open market and because of the international um, cooperation, we want uh, visible uh, results. Merck has uh, 70,000 um, employees in uh, 17 different countries. We develop uh, difficult uh, uh, to be treated uh, um, diseases by uh, res making research in a new medication and treatment. Our material enable uh, a faster and ever uh, uh, better and more efficient uh, data chips. For us, the science is the core, is the heart of our work. We contribute tremendously to combat uh, corona with products and services for the basic research, but also for the development of diagnostic uh, tests. We support uh, more than 50 COVID-19 vaccination projects. We also cooperate with the Bill Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. Our uh, target is uh, to uh, accelerate uh, research uh, for a vaccine. Apart from scientific research and the uh, knowledge, we also rely on international cooperation. Now, in the midst of the pandemic, it has become clear that the large problems of the future can only be dealt with in a, multi, in a multilateral international level. Let's just think about uh, sciences. Since COVID-19, 
uh, researchers and clinics have been uh, exchanging data and information ever, more than ever before in order to make sure that a vaccine can be developed as a very strong cooperation between policies, uh, sciences, econ the economy and NGOs is certainly going to contribute to the um, overcoming a lot of other difficulties and problems we have such as uh, climate change and, of course, free trade. The following factors are going to be of an important role in order to make sure that we uh, can be successful in the future in Hessen, but also elsewhere. We should commit ourselves for um, a committed and fair trade, internationally speaking. So we need high standards from the manufacturing up to the consumer's protection, we need clear and transparent um, rules. Uh, and also, we have to realize what investment potentials there are. And also, the uh, increase of the growth of the superpowers should not overcome the right. The right should decide. International companies, uh, such as Merck, have a very complicated uh, delivery supply chain and uh, uh, relocation of um, uh, manufacturing sites that won't solve them. There is a stronger and stronger resilience against supply uh, chains and transport um, uh, routes. So we need more international cooperation. Fair world trade needs clear mechanisms in order to overcome political conflicts. Conflicts can be quite normal. What is decisive is that how we deal with these conflicts. So there is um, a criticism which is justified, but this should not be uh, a reason just to ignore the regulations. Part of the country, it should be um, the encouragement to change the regulations. Europe has a political focus, and we should always see it uh, and uh, use it in fair trade. This is the right moment to do and something about it. Now, the timing of today's meeting is increasingly important just after the elections in the United States. I'm sure that the present situation in the United States is going to be a, a topic of conversation today. Thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a um, lively discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Oshman, for this uh, wonderful introduction for today's um, discussion. Before starting and before introducing to, to you the panel, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact uh, to the, uh, that you can actually ask questions either by a phone number, which you can see here in Belgium, 0472 03 and 81 with the Belgium prefix or uh, via email to streamline at lwv-brussels.de. So this is uh, the uh, email address you can use, and you can uh, pass on any questions you may possibly have. Now, finally, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, the interesting panel to you. We have a large um, um, array of different speakers and uh, uh, so that we can talk about the trade policies and what we can actually do in the times of Chi America and uh, Corona. What can we do about trade policies? And we're going to have a look at the different aspects. Now, first of all, um, Dr. Uh, Oshman, who is the CEO of Merck, has just been speaking. He's been um, a CEO at, since 2011. He was first um, uh, responsible for health there, and since uh, 2016, he has been the CEO. Apart uh, from that, he has some experience from the United States, and he has been working in the pharmaceutical um, sector and also in the context of the United Nations. And he is uh, originally a vet. So he is something who knows uh, something about medicine, and he can certainly help us in the discussion. Secondly, we have Dr. Um, Sven Simon, who is a member of the European Parliament, has been since 2019. 
is in uh, the Committee of International Trade and the Aachen uh, Committee. He uh, originally studied a law. He's a professor and politician, so he's a full agenda. And he uh, wrote his PhD about uh, WTO and uh, European law. So this is a topic which uh, certainly uh, is very interesting. So he's been looking after the WTO and has been thinking about it for a long time. Another representation, uh, Piotr Rajovsky, uh, very difficult to pronounce a, Pol a Polish name, a uh, representative free trade and uh, trade strategy. And so, since several years, he's been working in the commission. And then we have a scientist, uh, Janali Shodi. She is a PhD researcher at the Kieler Institute for International um, Cooperation. She's a Curie Fellow and a Rhodes Scholar. So she has a tremendous experience uh, in different backgrounds about trade issues. And she's presently looking after the uh, um, effects of uh, trade policies on climate. And last but not least, we have Teddy Burns, uh, head of life science, government and public affairs at Merck. So as the, na the name uh, suggests, he's an American. And um, he, uh, uh, he worked in the American administration, not in the last one, but uh, previously, so he can certainly give us a few interesting insights uh, um, what uh, is being done in the, the, the American uh, Department of Commerce. So he's also been a lawyer. And apart from that, uh, in the upper policies where he had been um, um, legal counselor, so he has practical experiences and he's going to give us some insights in several topics. So this is about the introduction. Thank you very much. And I apologize. Aber jetzt wollen wir einsteigen. Nochmal für diejenigen, die uns zugeschaltet sind. Wir haben Dolmetschung, Deutsch und Englisch. Das heißt, Sie können sich den Kanal auswählen, auf dem Sie uns hier folgen. Und jetzt wollen wir einfach mal mit einer ersten Frage meinerseits in die Diskussion einsteigen. Wir haben schon einiges gehört, Stichwort Lieferketten, Stichwort WTO, Stichwort, wie wichtig der globale Handel auch für unseren Wohlstand hier in Europa ist. Auf der anderen Seite haben wir natürlich jetzt nicht zuletzt wegen der Reaktion auf Covid leider auch die Erfahrung machen müssen, dass es ein gewisses, einen gewissen Reflex gab, dass man wieder sich nur auf nationale Interessen fokussieren wollte und dass man plötzlich wieder Diskussionen hat über Renationalisierung. Meine Frage an alle meine Panelisten ist zunächst einmal, was glauben Sie, wie kann man denn die richtige Balance finden zwischen einem offenen globalen Markt einerseits, der anderen Seite aber auch die lokale Industrie und Produktion so zu unterstützen, dass sie auf diesem globalen Markt eine Chance haben. Ich würde als erstes ähm, den Floor sozusagen an Herrn Professor Simon geben, der uns vielleicht ein paar Ideen vermitteln kann. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank für die freundliche Einladung und auch die freundliche, sehr freundliche Begrüßung. Nun, ich denke, dass äh, das richtige Gleichgewicht zwischen offenen globalen Märkten einerseits und der Unterstützung der lokalen Wirtschaft und Industrie andererseits ganz grundsätzlich erst einmal der Markt treffen sollte. Der Markt, der wir ja alle letzten Endes sind, die Verbraucherinnen und Verbraucher, wissen im Grunde zunächst einmal am besten, was sie wo einkaufen möchten. Und hier wächst ja auch durchaus eine Verantwortung und ein Bewusstsein, wenn wir eben jedem bewusst machen, was es bedeutet, was wir für Produkte einkaufen und wo wir sie einkaufen. Und dann sind natürlich auf der anderen Seite die politischen Entscheidungsträger dafür verantwortlich, Schiedsrichter zu sein. Als Schiedsrichter responsible, because they have to uh, be like judges uh, for fair conditions on the market. And at this point, I think in the last uh, decades, uh, we didn't follow uh, as much because we now uh, are talking about the level 
playing field with fair conditions. We have higher protectionism, uh, especially in the US, first of all, is a classical reflex that we have often seen. And uh, this is, in a certain uh, sense, uh, uh, an effect people have to uh, see that we have fair conditions. We fight against uh, uh, unfair uh, trade, that we have standards for our uh, environment, and, and that we don't want any social dumping uh, thanks to European or uh, international trade. And here, first of all, uh, if you ask, uh, it's first of all the companies that have a responsibility and the most part of the companies uh, knows about this responsibility. So we should not follow the lowest standard. And at the end, it is also uh, politics that has to do everything that is fair trade, is fair and free. Thank you very much for this first comment. And then I would like to give Piotr Witkowski from the commission who asked him. Uh, right now, we have consultations from the commission of open strategic autonomy, and the commission is not thinking about only yesterday how we can find the right balance and who should do what. What about the commission? Where do we have the right balance? for this uh, uh, open market. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, let me, uh, let me maybe say that um, uh, indeed throughout the entire year, um, uh, throughout this COVID crisis, uh, we've seen a, a growing tension between uh, open markets and uh, internal uh, measures. Uh, and um, it's 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 quite natural that um, uh, in, in in a crisis we try to find um, uh, solutions. Uh, but um, the, the the point that I would like to get across today is that uh, knee jerk reactions and um, and and trying to find long term solutions um, uh, at a point like this is extremely difficult, uh, and that we need to understand what the problems actually are and uh, and only take um, uh, long-term decisions uh, on that basis. What is most important for us uh, uh, in, 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 in today's context is that we uh, prepare uh, ourselves uh, to accelerate the recovery uh, and that we ensure our economic growth, uh, more jobs, better jobs, and more resilience uh, in uh, the long term. Uh, and the answer, of course, to this is then a combination of measures, most likely a combination of measures, though very clearly um, open uh, global, global markets uh, have to be the, uh, the basis. Uh, definitely the balance of whatever we do has to go uh, in uh, this uh, direction because uh, open markets uh, are uh, a way of ensuring that uh, we ensure that we have economic uh, efficiency and that we have uh, the best allocation of, uh, of scarce uh, resources uh, and that uh, our uh, supply chains and that our economy uh, can be uh, resilient. What is important here uh, to uh, keep in mind is that we need to um, uh, prepare ourselves not just for um, uh, a future crisis that exactly mirrors uh, the one that we're going through today. We need to prepare for, uh, for situations that perhaps are unimaginable, perhaps are quite different in, in, in nature and, uh, and in scope. And the best way of, uh, of ensuring that uh, we are uh, prepared for that is precisely uh, to tap in uh, to um, uh, global markets, uh, remain connected uh, with our international uh, partners, ensure that uh, we have resilient uh, supply chains, uh, diversified uh, su uh, supply chains. Now, when we talk about the role of governments and business uh, uh, businesses, uh, I, I, I'm very much uh, echo um, what um, 
uh, Mr. Simon uh, said uh, a second ago, uh, it's very clear that it's the responsibility of businesses uh, to um, uh, understand their vulnerabilities, to draw lessons from their vulnerabilities, and to take appropriate uh, measures uh, to mitigate uh, these uh, vul vulnerabilities. Governments, uh, on the other hand, are a best place to analyze the situation at a macro level and to take uh, any necessary measures uh, that um, um, uh, that address uh, the uh, global situation and uh, move the, the, entire globe, um, the entire European economy toward a more resilient uh, stance. And in uh, my view, uh, an, a critical component of this is international dialogue and, um, uh, and uh, uh, discussions and alliance building with our partners. Thank you very much um, for this. Um, I would now have a question basically to Fernali. Um, potentially giving us a bit of a uh, extra European um, perspective on whether or not the EU is currently striking the right balance um, when you look at it from the outside. So is your well, I'd like to uh, begin with an optimistic note that a balance can be struck between the pursuit of openness on one hand um, and the pursuit of important domestic priorities such as economic resilience. Um, without compromising on some of these uh, fundamental values and the commitments made by uh, third countries as well as the EU to their various partners. Um, I think trade policy will certainly play a very key role um, if we are to strengthen the competitiveness and resilience as uh, the key terms are in this discussion of uh, domestic players within the EU and also in third countries and to guide the recovery from recent shocks such as uh, COVID, but um, also the trade conflicts that have been um, hitting trade and um, economic growth hard. Uh, but um, trade policy is on its own, I think, not sufficient and other complementary inputs are needed from uh, not just the EU, but also from third partners, such as a modernized infrastructure, financial stability, and an educated and versatile workforce. So in my view, investments as well as policy reforms in these critical areas would build capacity and trade competitiveness while keeping countries open to the flow of goods, ideas, capital, people, and technologies that's been um, an engine of growth and prosperity. Um, overall, I think uh, I'd like to echo the other panelists that um, an important element in trying to strike this balance is to continue the ongoing work of uh, coalition building um, at the WTO level, but also through the dense network of bilateral trade and investment agreements and through other plurilateral platforms as well. Um, my second point is that the EU has to strike a balance not only between pursuing openness and um, making sure that domestic players are shielded from unfair competition, but also this growing expectation that the bloc um, ought to do more on the issue of sustainability um, and overall climate security. Um, in a sense, I think climate is a strategic and competitive front in the trading system, since there is a substantial opening in setting standards, as well as developing, patenting and exporting environmental technologies. Therefore, countries are watching carefully what the uh, EU's policy response will be to this interlinked um, challenge of trade and climate. Um, and particularly third countries are closely following the discussions on the proposed Green Deal and its crucial elements like the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So here too, um, I think the focus will be to design an instrument that is not perceived as protectionist and is still committed to um, uh, the ideals of multilateralism and rules-based trade. Thank you for these uh, first um, uh, arguments. It's a very interesting point already raised. Um, now I would like to give uh, the same question um, to your son, um, who not only has potentially a more um, refined uh, perspective, but also obviously the insight from, from the company. So how, how is your answer to the question? Do you um, think uh, the balance should be, are we hitting it at the moment? Um, and uh, are the sort of responsibilities rightly distributed? Absolutely. Um, I would say that I, I very much agree with everything I've heard so far. And I, I'm not sure how much 
I'm not sure how much I can add here. I should say that, uh, you know, Peter made the very good point that we have to take a fact-based and empirical approach to, to dealing with this. And there's been a lot of sort of uh, reactions to, f to fear COVID and COVID-related economic crisis. Um, my view is that, is that the European Union has, has been the adult in the room um, in, in the global trading um, discussions in, 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 the last, in the last few years um, and has really done quite a good job striking this balance between keeping open markets. There hasn't been a rush to apply tariffs um, in any trade war um, with, uh, th that the European Union has been involved in, except for perhaps through multilateral withdrawal of concessions uh, due to, a, uh, due to a, a decision of the World Trade Organization. So uh, the EU has not rushed into that, into that uh, what I personally consider to be fruitless space of, of this tit for tat uh, of, of applying tariffs um, as a way of um, enhancing leverage uh, towards some kind of towards some kind of um, um, some uh, some kind of com not completely clear outcome, and, and so um, I, I think absolutely that tariff elimination is actually more the solution uh, to this problem. If we're gonna if we're gonna bring to the market all of those technologies, uh, and Merck Life Science is really a company that provides research, manufacturing, and quality assurance technologies to the vaccine manufacturers, the therapeutics manufacturers, and the diagnostic manufacturers of the world. If we're confronting tariffs as we move product around the world, and Merck does have a global supply chain, we are a company that operates in, in, in a global environment and we do manufacturing in the European Union, in the United States, and in China. Um, if, if we can't move that product around, uh, customers, patients in the end, uh, will suffer as a result of higher prices for the products that are actually the outputs um, into which all of these raw materials and, and equipment um, feed. So I, I think that's a really important point. But I also think resilience is a big issue. Um, and we need to invest in what I call bioinfrastructure. We need to invest in our ability to, to, um, to play in that space where um, it was once thought that it only made sense to build a single manufacturing facility or two manufacturing facilities to supply the world. You know, the, the economics of biomanufacturing have very much changed in the last decade, um, and, a, and a distributed model is much more likely economically viable today than it was 10 years ago. Um, but I, I also think the, um, one, one of the duties that we have as companies is to make sure that we have a diversity of, of providers for our supply chain. And, and I can tell you there was a lot of scrambling, a lot of late nights making sure that we could move shipments um, ac across borders to, to get to customers in time so that they could continue their production, whatever it was, whether it was COVID-19 related or, or, or something else. Um, but I have to say, by and large, I didn't see any major failures. But what one of our takeaways is certainly that that we are we are qualifying suppliers um, in in more geographically diverse jurisdictions to make sure that we have greater redundancy in our supply chain. Um, so, in short, I think the EU has really been taking um, a very considered approach here, um, and I think that they're with a change in administration in the United States, I think the EU should continue to play a leadership role, um, bringing people together, hopefully urging parties to come back to a multilateral discussion table. Because after all, there is unfinished business at the WTO. We have a zero for zero pharmaceutical agreement that could bring parties together to eliminate entirely tariffs on finished pharmaceuticals. That agreement should be expanded to include upstream inputs so that those companies that decide they want to manufacture in a certain place won't be sitting behind a tariff wall. And then of course, uh, Sonali talked a little bit about climate. We have the unfinished environmental goods agreement at the WTO, which was a really um, remarkable plurilateral initiative. And that could certainly be revived um, if we see a US government that turns back to the WTO. Thank you, Drius. Um, very interesting uh, insights here as well. Um, I think it's uh, interesting to hear the vocabulary that you are using when uh, describing the EU and its role. I've heard the referee, Schiedsrichter from um, 
Mr. Zeman, I heard the adult in the room. Uh, the parents, um, everybody has a lot of uh, expectations. Sonali mentions that third to study uh, standards, to getting it right when it comes to the main to So my question would be, um, how do you deal with all these expectations as uh, the EU's, the block um, regulatory um, what, what do you want to achieve that you've been discussing recently? And what um, one can picture under this heading? And what would be the, uh, the trade and investment policy changes? That's, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me again start with uh, with a, 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 a small fact. Uh, we have um, uh, just finished a public consultation on uh, on the trade policy uh, review. Um, as of uh, Monday morning, we had four hundred and five. Uh, official responses to the to the consultation uh, that was 100% uh, more than we had on Friday, uh, so a very big increase over the uh, over the weekend. Uh, we're analyzing these uh, these submissions and. Uh, uh, we'll be coming out with uh, with with uh, uh, an analysis of that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, um, uh, open strategic autonomy uh, has been a central uh, theme uh, in the, this consultation process. Uh, and uh, in a nutshell, I would say that uh, this concept of open strategic autonomy reflects uh, the um, breadth of, uh, of of points made in the in in, in the in, in the discussion just now. Um, it's it's really about uh, presenting, striking that uh, uh, right balance between the the openness bit and uh, the uh, internal bit. Um, uh, though obviously, I'm 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 pretty certain that uh, the term itself uh, can uh, give rise uh, to questions and to various interpretations. Uh, strategic autonomy, as such. Uh, is, uh, is is often understood and has uh, and has its roots in fact in the military it's uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's a military term and uh, is often uh, as a result of that equated with uh, self sufficiency which obviously is, uh, is 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 not particularly a message that um, the, the 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 commission or the eu uh, should be um, should should be uh, sh should be sending. Um, we don't think that uh, that is the right approach to uh, economic uh, development, economic uh, growth, uh, and uh, that uh, and we think that uh, um, these negative connotations uh, can be misunderstood uh, by partners by our partners, and they can eventually be uh, self defeating. Uh, and so, from um, uh, from our perspective, uh, it's very important to emphasize the openness uh, bit uh, in, uh, in in this term. So, uh, open strategic uh, autonomy. Uh, and with that, um, we're uh, emphasizing uh, that we cannot just concentrate on the uh, internal side, even though there is a natural tendency uh, to uh, look at internal measures, uh, to look at what we can do to strengthen our economy uh, internally. However, if we do just that, um, we're, um, we're just looking at part of the picture, we're losing an opportunity. Uh, and as a result, um, we feel that um, uh, a more holistic uh, approach is needed in order to, uh, to achieve our uh, objectives. And this is where uh, the, 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 the term comes in, and this is why the term uh, um, was, uh, was developed. Uh, it uh, it uh, really emphasizes the point about the EU reaping fully the benefits of uh, an open economy, of engagement with uh, our uh, international uh, partners, of the opportunities that international trade and uh, and uh, and other markets uh, create, while at the same time continuing to uh, develop what is needed uh, internally and developing the tools that we need in order to protect our openness uh, from uh, abuse, from unfair, uh, distortive uh, trade practices uh, as, uh, uh, as an example. Uh, and let me just um, refer uh, um, uh, back to what Sonali said about uh, the the, uh, the Green Deal and emphasize uh, one uh, particular point about uh, the, the, the links uh, between the internal and 
and external, which uh, I think is, is, is also a reflection then of the, 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 the importance of open strategic autonomy, of the term open strategic autonomy. Uh, and that is that uh, we have very ambitious uh, goals with regard uh, to, the, uh, to the Green Deal. It's a top priority, it's the top priority of, uh, uh, of the Commission, of the, uh, of the EU. Uh, we can only achieve uh, the uh, ambitions that we have if we uh, include uh, the external uh, side, uh, if we uh, make use of the opportunities that uh, international trade uh, uh, creates, and if we uh, engage into uh, cooperation alliance building with our uh, international partners. Thank you, Piotr. And you already mentioned uh, Nali's uh, view on uh, how important it is uh, that uh, the EU remains in, in touch and uh, in contact with international partners and countries. And also, Sonali, um, you, uh, you said uh, the commitment um, is not only an EU one, but also the, the countries uh, that have commitments for the EU when they enter partnerships. So, um, in the context of the Green Deal discussion, there also has been some um, criticism with regard to the potential new protectionism, in, protectionism instrument um, into which the Green Deal can Could you maybe um, elaborate a little bit more on this? So what would be the fear uh, from, from a third country perspective, maybe also from a country, um, how, you know, when they look at the EU Green Deal trade, um, do they go up in arms? Are they afraid? Are they looking for other um, sources of income and of, uh, for other distribution possibilities? Um, or do you think, um, you know, the, the, exactly as you say, the guidance um, that could also help them with their transition? Okay, uh, thank you for the question, Sandra. So um, it's, a, it's a very complex question, so I will try and uh, structure my response. I think that um, the key element that's of concern to uh, several countries has been the um, uh, proposal of the carbon border adjustment mechanism within the Green Deal. And it's because um, it would essentially tax the carbon content of uh, producers that are exporting from third countries to the EU. And um, the effect of such a tax has raised some concerns. Um, and I think broadly those concerns relate to protectionism, but also to increases in trade costs. Um, they're about compatibility with existing commitments of the EU and also about burden sharing. Uh, so on protectionism, I think the worry is that um, a carbon tax um, and um, the Green Deal could be affected by special interests. Um, and I think how the EU addresses this concern will be extremely important in avoiding future conflict and retaliation from trade partners. So from the start, I think the design and operation of the Green Deal and the carbon border adjustment has to be highly transparent. So these concerns can be allayed as much as possible. Um, especially around um, possible manipulation for protectionist reasons. Um, the second concern I think is about potential trade costs. So the regime will likely um, raise some administrative costs for firms, whether it's documentation requirements or more complex requirements such as calculating the carbon intensity of products. And we know from the literature and economics that administrative costs do inhibit the entry of new firms into the market and they disproportionately hurt smaller enterprises. So um, I think we also have to keep in mind what are the distributional implications of uh, new costs, um, and that needs to be thought through as well. Uh, the third concern is about compatibility, but um, I'm no lawyer, but there are questions um, as to how it will fit within the existing commitments uh, enshrined in WTO law or in various FTA texts. And I think Brussels is already very aware of this, um, and they, I think there is this um, clear uh, priority that uh, the Green Deal and the associated instruments have to be non-discriminatory from the start and constructed in line with existing commitments. Uh, nevertheless, I think stepping up dialogue with countries would be a good move so that um, we can get their views on board early on in designing the instruments. Um, and finally, of course, uh, is the issue of burden sharing. So developing countries to not have the same access or capacity in low carbon technologies. And they also face considerable financial constraints in adapting their processes. So um, we have to see how um, we can square the Green Deal with 
uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility that's enshrined in the Paris Agreement. So on all these issues, I think um, a key message is that third countries would also be closely watching the reactions from uh, US and China before finalizing their own position. Um, but uh, a common expectation is that um, there should be more communication and engagement on the Green Deal and the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism um, to consider the distributional consequences, uh, to ensure its compatibility. Um, but I think some good proposals have already been floated on how to address these concerns. Thank you, Sonali. Uh, interesting point right there, especially also on the administrative cost and burden um, that uh, countries outside the EU might face. Uh, my question would be to Mr. Simon on this. You mentioned um, that obviously uh, trade is uh, very important uh, for our welfare. Um, now we have a discussion on uh, diligence by corporates. Um, we have a discussion on the Green Deal. So all of this might actually add to the burden of the country, but it seems to be something that within the EU is uh, very much demand also uh, by people, by citizens. They want to see um, a good due diligence uh, process. Uh, how would you address the issue? Um, is a due diligence well, can you can you give us a closer look at the significance of trade policies? I, I, I do hope that I understood your question correctly. There are some technical problems, unfortunately, and I wrote in the chat that there also is a stop of the English translation, so perhaps I answer in English. Um, well, there is a lot to unpack here. Um, regarding the skepticism towards trade policy in general, I think indeed that um, there is much explaining that we have to do. Um, and the, the most important question is perhaps which we should explain is why are we trading at all? Uh, the idea of comparative uh, cost advantages, advantages going all the way back to the theories of uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo is unfortunately not very intuitive to the public and I noticed also not to policymakers. So uh, first of all, we should do more to explain the importance of trade and the theori theoretical background. That is not known, not well known. Um, I teach public international law and international economic law and this is always the first lecture that I try to explain, why do we trade with each other? That is obviously unknown um, in public and also in policymaker fields. And now I don't know whether you asked something more on... Ask about uh, the due diligence. Ah, uh, yeah, due, dil due diligence and then the supply chains, yeah. Um, I mean, on the subject of reshoring or even decoupling of supply chains, um, in a social market economy, it should first of all be left to companies themselves where they want to invest and with whom they want to trade. Still, we should think about ways and means to diversify our, our supply chains um, to reduce dependencies. And during the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we realized how dangerous dependencies on a few suppliers can be, especially in vital industries as such as pharmaceuticals and medical technology. Um, a way to undertake diversification um, is active industrial policy with a limited scope. And that means um, identifying certain fields such as personal protective gear in which we want strengthen diversification and have a level of self-sufficiency. Um, when we talk about due diligence and supply chain uh, transparency, this can be a tool to enhance level playing fields as it is able to uncover environmental and social dumping. And when we talk about um, due diligence, we should think about new technologies um, uh, of blockchain and using technologies like that in order to um, create and establish uh, supply chain transparency. Uh, however, we need to be very mindful. We must not overburden small and medium-sized importers with unnecessarily complicated rules. 
Moreover, we do not want to see a chilling effect on overall trade with threats of uh, prosecution and sanctions. And as my colleague already mentioned, there are still problems with WTO conformity um, when we talk about uh, measures like carbon border adjustment, taxes, or things like that. Thank you. And um, apologies for any technical difficulties that you are experiencing. It's something with the internet connection here in Brussels working well. Um, I would ask one question to uh, Ted Burns, um, and then I'll see if there's any questions coming from the audience. With the, the, uh, the trade conflict between the US and China, in your view, for the EU, how should the EU position itself so that you, as a European company, are not getting uh, sort of uh, into the monstrum or, you know, are sort of protecting your interests, uh, can continue with your business, or your activities? Yes, again, um, and, and, and thanks for the, for the, for the, for the excellent but, but rather tough question, because I, again, this is really kind of a call to leadership for the European Union, where we are seeing a reactive, a, a reactive mode between, between these other two trading partners. I, I can tell you we've been very active um, engaging with the US government, with the Chinese government, trying to explain why applying tariffs on raw materials and inputs into pharmaceutical supply chains is, is a policy that hurts patients and that hurts those companies that are coming up with the solution to a COVID-19 epidemic. Um, and so I think, I think that uh, the very fact that the European Union hasn't, hasn't, fo hasn't focused on these areas in a negative way, as we've seen um, with these other trading partners, um, is, is already setting a good example. Um, but I do think that um, there needs to be a, a recognition that trade has has a, an important role to play in dealing with the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, and that means that we need to be able to move all of these inputs and, and all of this equipment around the world and provide them to those companies that are doing research, that are doing manufacturing, um, whether it's diagnostics or vaccines or therapeutics. We need to be able to provide those at the, at the lowest cost without any tariff cost um, in addition. And it's not just the United States and China that are applying tariffs um, to, to all of these inputs. There are many other countries that are using this as a revenue raising measure. And, and I do not, again, include the EU in that category, but I think there needs to be a, a, a leadership message coming from the EU about how this is not just an economic, not just a trade issue. This is an issue that should resonate with, with, with citizens who are worried about COVID-19 and their ability to get timely access to, all, to, to things like diagnostics. I think the other thing that, that the EU as well as the US and China ought to think about is what is the role that's st stockpiling of things like raw materials and the inputs into a manufacturing supply chain? What, what stabilizing role could that play? And so for example, it doesn't make much sense to stockpile diagnostics for a future pandemic that hasn't been identified, it's not possible. It doesn't make sense to stockpile therapeutics or vaccines for an unknown epidemic, but it does make sense to, to look at some of the raw materials that go into those ma that manufacturing. Things like guanidine thiocyanate, like lateral flow membrane, those are well-known inputs into biopharmaceutical and diagnostic supply chains that could be highly susceptible to stockpiling. And that way you can manage the shock of a, of a huge demand surge uh, in the face of an epidemic in future uh, circumstances. And I think the government governments have a very important role to play in in, in funding and creating those kinds of stockpiles and collaborating with companies uh, that are willing to help. Um, interesting uh, views again, also on um, the, the way that you as a company obviously are engaging in other regions of the world. So um, my question, because uh, some of you mentioned it a couple of times, um, is uh, resilience. So resilience has come up as the new concept 
um, to me, sometimes it's equally uh, fluffy um, as the idea of the open strategic autonomy. Um, maybe a question to the sort of lawmaker a bit of our, our panel here. First, uh, maybe to Piotr, um, what do you think, um, first, uh, on resilience, uh, what is the top, let's say, three activities the EU needs to do to achieve this resilience? And second, um, Bernd just said, the EU needs to show leadership. So um, from, from your point of view um, on the trade desk, um, what, what does that mean to you? What would you take from this? Um, what kind of leadership, um, what kind of actions um, would you then take? All right, thank you very much. Um... I would say two things, not three uh, at this point. Uh, the, the first thing and the uh, most fundamental thing when it comes to uh, to, to resilience, by, by, by which we mean the ability to recover from uh, uh, from a crisis, uh, would be to, to understand uh, our vulnerabilities. Um, uh, without a thorough understanding of what the problems actually are, uh, we cannot uh, even dream of talking about uh, um, resilience or let alone uh, achieving. Uh, resilience. Uh, so fundamental analysis of, um, uh, of, uh, of our supply chains and the vulnerabilities uh, of, uh, of our supply chains is, is, is needed. Uh, understanding um, where the problems lie, what is critical for us, why it's critical for us, uh, and only on that basis uh, can we uh, can we de uh, devise uh, solutions? Uh, the second point, then, uh, on uh, on resilience, uh, in terms of, uh, of of what should actually uh, be done, an element that is uh, that, that that will form part of uh, of absolutely any uh, potential approach uh, to uh, the the question of of how do we uh, enhance our resilience, and that is uh, diversifying uh, our um, uh, trade relations. Uh, we need to have um, uh, agreements in place. Uh, we have we need to develop our bilateral relationships. Uh, we need to strengthen the multilateral system, all in the interest of ensuring that we have a rules based uh, trade uh, uh, as the basis for our uh, trade relations. It is only in a situation where uh, trade is uh, stable, it's predictable, uh, it's done on the basis of uh, clear rules, rules that, are, uh, that everyone understands and knows how to enforce. Uh, it's only on that basis that uh, we can uh, ensure that uh, we have uh, diversified uh, sources of, uh, of supply and that uh, our economy uh, can be uh, resilient and can um, react uh, and can um, um, bounce back from any potential uh, problem that uh, that appears uh, uh, in the future. Otherwise, uh, we're just um, um, uh, uh, looking around and 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 looking for false solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. And then my question to Sven Simon again: um, There has been call for leadership um, with the EU. What would that mean for you as a, as a lawmaker, um, as a decision maker, as a politician? Where would you think um, you needs to take up this leadership? Well, I think our biggest problem um, in the moment is indeed that the EU is not taking leadership. And um, herefore, we have to be honest and analyze why that is the case. First of all, there are missing competencies um, in the primary law and also the institutional setting is perhaps not perfect and we should improve the ability to act for the European Union. Secondly, of course, we need to be very active to uphold the multilateral institutions. We have now to use the chance um, together with Mr. Biden to bring back the United States to the World Trade Organization. Um, they were blocking or they are blocking um, the, the appellate body. And that, I must say, started already under the Obama administration. It was not only the Trump administration, unfortunately. So we have a chance, a little chance, perhaps, but we um, should not um, think that the world changes in, in this matter or that concern with, with Mr. Biden. But perhaps the wording is a bit more polite than it was under the Trump administration. And then we as Europeans have two possibilities. The first is using our economic uh, power. The common market is still an economic power in the world. And secondly, and here we have the problem, 
um, is um, through trade agreements, standard setting through trade agreements, being influential through trade agreements, exporting in a way our standards of environmental protection, labor protection, um, uh, climate change and so on, what is important for our values, individual freedoms, rule of law, democracy, standards of the European Union through trade agreements. And here we have the big problem. We do not have a democratic majority in parliaments for trade agreements. The Greens, uh, not perhaps the whole group, but um, some activists are simply blocking any trade agreement. It does not matter, honestly, what's in this trade agreements. If we look at the Mercosur agreement, of course there are problems in Brazil, but this trade agreement is the most advanced, really very well negotiated by the commission. We have legally binding the Paris agreement. We have a sustainable chapter, which is legally binding. Of course, the enforcement mechanism is not, not the same like on the national level, um, but the problem is um, that we don't get it through since it is blocked in the parliaments. We don't have a majority in the moment as it, it is blocked by activists, um, mainly the Greens from the Greens, socials, also some social democrats, and also blocked uh, in national uh, parliaments. And for that reason, I think when we start, and hopefully we do that sooner than later, the Conference on the Future of Europe, we need to talk about uh, improving the ability to act um, because it's always a problem when the European Parliament and national and perhaps local parliaments have to give uh, their consent. And then we really honestly have to take and put the question on the table, how do you want to influence the standards in the world if you block trade agreements? Are we more successful with trade agreements or without trade agreements? And my clear answer is, the only chance of the Europeans is to have influence in this direction with trade agreements. And this is a very difficult uh, uh, situation that I try to convince colleagues. And I would really love if I get the help and the support of the industry, of the consumers, um, that we need those trade agreements. That's our only chance to have influence in the world. But in the moment, um, it is not a, a situation. And we see that now China um, steps in. That's the, the other uh, issue which we have to explain to, to the people, that if the European Union is not managing to have trade agreements, then the Chinese come and take over without our standards. That's our problem in a way. Thank you, Ben Zeman, on this one. We are coming really close to the end of our um, uh, panel discussion here. Uh, we did have a bit of a delay in the beginning, so maybe you can bear with us a bit longer. I do have one question that sort of tags on to what has just been discussed with Sonali. Um, the importance of trade agreements and how they really um, help economies to develop. Obviously, um, the issue has been um, become much more interesting over the weekend with the Asia agreement, the, I don't know how we officially call it, no, the RCEP or the RCEP. Um, so maybe the question goes first to Sonali and then to Vidius Burns. If you both could just like in a very short two minutes statement sort of uh, give your view on how this changes the dynamic um, for the global trade policy debate. Okay. Um, Thank you, Sandra, for your question. If I understood correctly, um, you'd like me to explain um, how trade agreements act as vehicles for standards um, and exporting standards and what the role of uh, big block, um, big trade blocks are, such as RCEP. So I think um, just to jump on the issue of RCEP, um, what's clear from the text is that um, its uh, biggest advantage is really in the area of rules of origin, that it's bringing together um, a very complicated mishmash of different rules of origin requirements under one clean framework. And uh, this is essential uh, for integrating um, regional value chains in, in the Asian region. But on the issue of standards, I think uh, the RCEP doesn't go as far as um, recent agreements have from the EU side, these deep free trade agreements like EU-Japan or uh, CETA. So, um, certainly, I think that um, standards or the race for setting standards globally will be through uh, the channel of trade agreements, but um, 
Um, I think the Asian um, trade partners haven't yet reached that consensus primarily because there's so much heterogeneity across countries in, in their uh, priorities, in their stages of development. So uh, there's certainly an open space yet for setting standards. Thank you. Um, interesting view um, on the uh, sort of importance of the uh, rules of origin requirements. Um, my question again to you, Bern, um, how's your view on the R step and um, how is that going to be then? Well, I'm not an expert on RCEP, but 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 from what I'm reading, I think Sonal is actually ac absolutely correct. It's not it's not a very deep agreement when it comes to all the disciplines that have been embraced by the parties ar around the table. Um, but it's also an agreement that lacks key parties that we care about, at least in our company, based upon our footprint. And so, um, you know, it's an example of chi of China, um, you know, showing leadership um, in an environment where um, there may have been a vacuum um, left by at least one of the one of the um, the global players that um, at least for the last couple of years has stepped back um, from trade negotiations. Um, I don't think, um, by the way, and I don't think the I th I think Sven, you're absolutely correct. I don't I don't see the Biden administration jumping like headfirst into a bunch of trade negotiations at this time. They're going to be very careful. But I think what they will pay very close attention to is any overtures from the European Union. They will take those very seriously because they realize that one one of the reasons that where the United States is in the situation that it's in right now is that it didn't play with allies as well as it could have um, in this in this broader trade agreement um, sort of firmament. And, and so RCEP in many respects is a kind of a completely normal reaction to a vacuum. Um, and and who could blame the Chinese government for pursuing that opportunity? Um, but I think that you know we would be looking for something more ambitious and something that in, that includes more of the countries um, that are global traders. Thank you, Tadeus, and thank you to all the panelists. We have reached the end of our panel debate today. Thank you so much for your input. It's been very interesting. I think the main takeaway from my perspective, at least, has been the EU is being called on to show leadership. It's been the adult in the room. It's supposed to stay the adult in the room. When it changes um, its own sort of priorities, it needs to communicate them transparently and clearly to third countries to make sure um, that everyone understands where the direction of the travel really is. So. Uh, Thank you all for contributing um, for your interesting views. Let me just conclude um, our sort of uh, little discussion today with a big thank you to the team here at the Landesvertretung Hessen who have been really running behind the scenes trying to make everything work um, even though the technology has been not very cooperative. Um, I've um, been asked to mention two further um, interesting um, events organized by the Landesvertretung one tomorrow. One is it's on uh, 30 Jahre Deutsche Einheit, 18, 11. Sie sind eingeladen. We have 30 years of German unity. You can see that on live stream. And the second one is the 19th. Uh, we have 15 years of European uh, College for Security and Defense. I hope you could have uh, you have learned something from our discussion. Thank you very much to everybody who was participating and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.